<laughs> All right, new rule. <laughs> if you're going to ask a question, make sure you ask it when I got the recording on. All right? Because <laughs> once again, just a second, I, I stopped the recording for those at home. I, I got a flurry of, hey, question. So new rule. <laughs> I'm not entertaining any more questions unless people at home can hear it. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, Sunita, I think your question was, uh, in the example I just gave about the taxes, first of all, A, that was made up on the spot, so uh, forgive me, um, but it's true. But your question was, could they advise them to change? The, the answer is most certainly not. You know, Now, when the real estate agent helped write the purchase agreement for the buyer, that would have been the time for the real estate agent to in, try and let me emphasize the word try to inject his morals and say, hey, I know you want to offer that, but I don't really think that's right that you're paying back taxes. Maybe we should just get these taxes prorated. I think that would be better. Now, here's the problem. One, maybe that agent that helped guide that also believed that paying back taxes were a cool thing. So he may not have tried. Two is he may have tried to interject and give advice and say, you know, that's not the customary practice here in Indiana. If you're listening in Indiana, that's not customary to pay back taxes. It's to prorate to the day of closing or the day before closing, whichever. <clears throat> if you're in another state, maybe it is. But in Indiana, the agent could have tried and maybe the buyer overruled him and said, no, I really want to make this offer really good by giving him the seller the benefit of back paying the taxes. So no is the answer to your question. And all that other crap was just the long explanation. Once the escrow officer receives the purchase agreement in escrow, that's what he must follow. They can't interject or call the one of the buyers and sellers and go, dude, I don't think this was right. We should change this. That's not their position. Their position is to just close the way of the agreement. That's what their ethical requirement is, not to change ideas. Those ideas should have been or potentially could have been when they wrote the purchase agreement by the buyer and his agent at that time. All right. So <laughs> new rule questions now only when I'm recording. Uh, we don't want to cheat the people at home. So moving forward onto the slide you see up here on our uh, screens. And for those of you at home, we're going to get into the fun section of the class. And I say that in all <laughs> comedy. <laughs> no, uh, honesty. Yeah, that's it. That's what I meant to say, in all honesty. We're going to talk about some of the Indiana Code and specifically the prohibiting of unfair methods. This of unfair competition, unfair or deceptive acts. These are the ethics requirements. And remember, an ethics requirement is for a body of people. Morals are your own personal compass. Now, hopefully your morals line up with the ethics. If they don't, quit. You know, simple as that. Or change your morals. Uh, I, I don't think a person can do that. I think by this age, at least by my age, it would be hard. But I'm not saying it couldn't be done. So specifically, there are two sections that the Indiana Department of Insurance wants to make sure we cover because these are unfair or deceptive practices which would violate or constitute an unethical practice. So if you look at section 27-4-1-3, got it? You got all that? <laughs> It specifically deals with unfair methods of competition and unfair and deceptive practices in the business of insurance. And there are several things we're going to talk about. And as you know, attorneys love to cover every minute detail. And that is very important if you ever in a court case that you have something explained down to the minutia. However, when you're trying to read it sometimes, it gets a little 
muddled. So for instance, look up on the board, number one, making, issuing, circulating, or causing to be made, which means you had somebody in your office do it because you could always go, well, I didn't make that. That's what the law says. Uh, I didn't make it. It was my assistant. Well, now, so here's the minutia, making, issuing, circulating, or causing to be made, issued, or circulate, uh, circulated, any estimate, illustration, circular, or statement that misrepresents the terms of the policy. So, for example, if you gave the wrong policy amount, that would be a misstatement, and you did it to get the business. That would be a lie, and then they show up, and it's a different price. That would be unfair or unethical. Um, remember, this is covering all insurance, too. It's from the Indiana Department of Insurance. Once again, if you're in Virginia or Florida or one of the other states, I am sure there are very similar, uh, especially in Florida, I've looked them up, they're almost dead equal to this. Uh, misrepresenting the terms of the policy to be issued, uh, the dividends or surplus previously paid. So if you said, oh, we've been paying out for 20 years on this policy and trying to get someone to buy it by giving them false information about historical stuff, that would be a problem. If you misrepresent the financial conditions of the insurer, oh, we're an A-plus rated strong billion dollar company and they're in the meantime filing foreclosure or bankruptcy, not foreclosure, misspoke, sorry, wrong brain working. Um, if they're filing bankruptcy because they're financially insolvent. Um, using the name or title of a policy or class, misrepresenting the true nature, you know, hey, it's whole life instead of term life, or it's, you know, a general warranty deed and, there's, and really being conveyed by a quick claim deed, making or representing to any policy holder uh, the purpose of inducing such policy holder to lapse surrender of policies insurance. Now, <clears throat> what that means is there are people all the time that say, hey, you know, buy the policy, and then when it comes time to renew it, just drop it. You cannot tell them that. Oh, yeah, just do this so you get this benefit, and then when it comes time to renew, just drop it. Or after the benefit, just call and cancel the insurance. Um, not so much seen necessarily in the title world, more in some of the other insurance agencies. Making, and then if you look on the screen, I didn't want to write all that same stuff, making, distributing, or causing to be made, blah, 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 derogatory uh, to the financial condition of the insurer, which is calculated to insure any person engaged in the business. So don't be talking bad about other companies issuing or delivering, delivering or permitting an agent to do all of those things, promising a return uh, of a profit, can't do that, entering into a contract combination in the form of a trust or otherwise, conspiring to restrain of commerce to the business of insurance. So don't tell people to get insured under a trust because it's a different policy um, that is the constraint of business, uh, monopolizing or attempting to mo monopolize any comp common or combining or conspiring with other persons to monopolize as part of the commerce of the business of insurance. So don't try and run other companies out of business by undercutting them and going to all your cohorts and say, hey, we can get rid of XYZ title if we all decide to charge less or tell our people we're charging less and then that company would go out of business that would be conspiring now title 3.6 deals with the tiff fee the t-i-e-f-f -F, the title insurance enforcement fund so what this is and you guys have all seen it it's five dollars currently for on the buyer side and on the seller side if there's a policy written, all right? So if a buyer is using cash and chooses not to have a policy, there's no TIF fee for that person. You very rarely will see that, but that's true. 
it's to provide the supplemental funding of the department related to the enforcement of the title insurance industry. So what it does is it funds this enforcement arm and pays the costs of hiring that person and employing staff and all of that to cover the enforcement arm. So basically, <laughs> you guys are paying the wages of the people that are going to come after you. All right. Bluntly put, the enforcement fund is the fund that is used to investigate potential issues with the, within the title industry world. It shall be administered by the commissioner of the Department of Insurance and the treasurer of the state uh, shall invest the money in the fund not currently needed. So there is a huge amount. Think about that. Let's assume for a minute that there's a buyer and seller uh, $5 fee on every transaction. We're going to throw up the cash transactions that don't pay one. Now, if you buy cash, by the way, I always recommend the seller, the buyer, go ahead and get an insurance policy anyway. You know, you're spending, what, 250000 in cash to buy a house? What's a couple hundred dollars more for an insurance policy? So I always tell my buyers that are buying cash, hey, let's get the insurance policy anyway. So let's assume, think about that. So there's $10 for every transaction that happens. How many transactions in the state? There's a lot of money in this fund. If there's a surplus not being used, then it gets invested to increase or gain interest, all right? And the, at the end of the year, um, the money in that fund does not revert to the general fund, all right? It sticks inside of that fund. And the budget can be changed or reappropriated depending on the balance of that fund. So I guess what I'm saying in theory is a auditor could be given a raise, an annual raise, if the budget allows for it. If the budget is in a deficit or is running at status quo, then maybe there's no raises given. All this is saying is section five of the Indiana code allows the surplus to be used further for enforcement. Um, all of these shall be deposited into the fund. Uh, all the fines, monetary penalties, costs imposed upon the person, all of these things for the violation that we just talked about, the 20, IC 27, other amounts remitted to the commissioner or the department are required by law to be deposited into the title. That is section six. So there are all the funds go into this, all right? A person who purchases title policy shall pay the insurer uh, that fee of $5. And see, that's what I was just saying. A person that purchased title insurance policy, so if it's a cash buyer and they don't buy that uh, lender's policy, which technically they would not need, they would not be paying that. Now, of that $5, it actually gets divvied up Two go to the fund two dollars and the remaining three dollars are depo deposited into that insurance fund all right so that is the five dollar tiff fund that we have all right are there any questions on dealing with the ethical practice of marketing and selling of title insurance <laughs> while i have this on well, I have the recording on. Don't wait till I stop because especially being this is the last uh, section, once I turn this off, we're, we're going to be kind of done. So any of you guys got a question out there? Yeah. Louder? I can barely hear you. No, it's, it's yeah. If you, the question is, is does everybody pay that? Uh, would be a good class. This is a really good class. You might want to pay attention. <laughs> I'm just giving them a hard time because I know him. Um, no, it's $5. Yeah, any any policy. So it's not based on the price of the policy. You know, you don't pay more into the TIF fund on a million dollar home and less on a $100,000 home. It's a flat $5. All right. 
for every policy written. Once again, don't want to beat the dead horse, no policy written, no $5 collected, all right? So it's to ensure the enforcement fund of the people that want to audit the title company, all right? So it's technically, if you think about it, it's not, they're not coming from tax money. They're not being paid out of the taxes that you would pay to the state. Oh, I pay taxes to the state. That Those taxes don't fund this enforcement arm. This TIF fee funds that enforcement arm. All right? Are we good? If you have any questions, feel free to give me an email. Uh, I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com. And at this point, I think we're going to call it done for this one hour of mandatory CE called the ethical practice in the marketing and selling of title insurance. Thank you.